When I was 19, I was working with a company establishing native plants in urban areas. When a reporter asked me, why are you interested in this kind of work? My answer was that I want to help save the world and get paid for it. That seemingly simple answer was more profound than I realized at the time. It is echoed in my mind as a business philosophy that has helped to guide me. I finished college and started a landscape business with a focus on ecology, incorporating natural systems into man-made systems and replacing purely aesthetic plants with edible, useful, and native plants in an aesthetic way. Then one day, I was sitting on the couch, TVs blaring in the background. I opened up the National Geographic article, and I read an article that ended up changing my life. That's when I was first exposed to the concept of biochar. And it was like a light turned on in my head. I, I saw it as an opportunity, an opportunity for me to make a difference in something that I'm very passionate about. Our soils are a resource. Our healthy soils are a resource that's easily lost. Abusive farming practices have already trashed some of our best lands. Populations are rising, cities are spreading, and fossil fuel has likely already reached its peak. Now is a very good time to reassess the ways that we interact with our farmland. And there's answers all around us. Organic, biodynamic, no-till, reduced till, agroforestry, natural farming. While none of these alone will solve our world's food sustainability crises, these tools are vital in our transition from a farming system that depletes our soil resources to one that builds them. And today, I have one more to add to your belt. Biochar is essentially a charcoal for soil a charred biomass intended for use in farming. It is highly porous, as all the passageways once used for transporting food and water throughout the plant material are gutted open, leaving only the carbon scaffolding remaining. It has a high surface area and a variable surface charge, which lend it a great ability to adsorb nutrients in many forms. Similar to its use in air and water filters, Charcoal and soil helps to keep the nutrients where they're needed. This is important. Phosphorus is limited. We have to mine this stuff. And you know what I didn't know a couple years ago that I know now that scares me a little bit? Is that peak phosphorus is as little as a few decades away. And unlike peak oil, there is no alternative to phosphorus. Nitrogen. The cost of nitrogen is rising in combination with the cost of energy because it's an extremely energy intensive process. So as you might guess looking at these pictures, biochar can hold water like a sponge. Being highly porous with a great ability to deal with water and nutrients, biochar makes a superb housing for microorganisms. Up here we have bacteria on char. Up here in the top middle we have fungi on char. This picture I love because you can see the fungal hi-fi just plugging right into the biochar. Kind of gives you a size reference to see why this makes such a superb housing for the microorganisms. When biochar has been applied to soils, they can show greater nutrient efficiency, greater water efficiency, and greater microbial activity, all which lead to greater productivity. This is key in our future success, is greater productivity on the soils that feed us. Carbon is an element of growing interest. Accumulation of unprecedented levels of carbon in our atmosphere is a potentially disastrous imbalance. Another imbalance that deserves our attention is the loss of carbon from the soil. Commonly known as humus, soil organic matter is an important measure of the health and productivity of any soil. 
So as plants grow, they capture carbon from the atmosphere and incorporate it into their bodies. And then when they're charred, much of that carbon is changed into a form which can resist decay for hundreds to thousands of years. Normally, that same carbon could have re-entered the atmosphere in as little as a few years or decades as the plant material naturally decayed. And charring of biomass doesn't consume energy, it releases energy. And we can capture that energy and use it to turn on our lights, to drive our cars, to power our factories. And when the remaining biochar is then applied to soil, what you get is a carbon negative energy. An energy production process which can actually help to sequester atmospheric carbon rather than increase it. Almost any biomass can work. Municipal green waste, agricultural waste, forestry waste, invasive species. There's no need to cut down valuable forests or to compete with food resources. There's already a few operations producing biochar and fuel and many more in the development stage. Some right here in Hawaii. The use of charcoal in soil is not a new idea. Biochar is a new word, that's for sure, but the use of charcoal in soil is, is nowhere near new. It's, it's been used by thousands, it's been used for thousands of years by various cultures worldwide. In Asia, there's a long-standing tradition where they'll take the rice hulls, make charcoal, and use them in their agriculture, usually composting first and in many other ways. For thousands of years this has been done. The Amazon Basin is an exceptional example of this. In the Amazon Basin, Ancient cultures improved areas of soil with the addition of large amounts of char. These soils, known as the terra preta, are drastically more fertile than the parent soils that surround them. So much so that when sold or leased for farming, these soils will typically receive about four to five times the normal market value. Now, we don't know exactly how these people made these amazing soils. We don't know the exact process, but I'm sure that with our machinery, our laboratories, and our brilliant minds, we can come up with our own techniques. And soils throughout the world already contain charcoal. It's been around as long as fire and life. First time I thought of that, I just had this image of a multi-celled little algae floating in a pond and a bolt of lightning, you know. Voila, the world's first char. And um, in, in Iowa, in the Midwest Plains of America, an area famous for its fertility, an average of 30% of the organic matter in the topsoil is already biochar, naturally occurring from grassland fires. And as you might guess from these pictures, some areas probably have quite a bit more than that. Plant species and microbes have evolved with charcoal as part of the soil. It's been largely overlooked by modern agriculture. But in recent years, that's changed. Research and interest in the topic has blossomed and spread like a wildfire. I've been making and using biochar for over three years now. I've produced more than 100 tons out of my own backyard and been able to support my family in doing so. I've had the opportunity to conduct some research myself, as well as a lot of observations and feedback. So here are some pictures from a trial I did with the Big Island Master Gardeners. On this side over here, we have bok choy at two weeks out with biochar and without biochar. Slipper size nine and a half. Here's that same bok choy at harvest. Notice the, uh, the size of the leaves on there compared to these little guys. Um, again, that's with biochar and without. Here within the same trial, we have beans at three weeks out with biochar and without biochar. And at five weeks out, again, with biochar and without. By this point, I was blown away. 
I mean, I'd already seen a lot of good stuff, but I mean, this nicely done trial with the master gardeners just blew me away. So I had to ask her to make sure, and she assured me very greatly that yes, all plots were planted on the same day and received the same amount of fertilizer. The only difference was the biochar. This man has been growing greenhouse tomatoes for over three decades and recently started using biochar in his potting media. And now he uses it as standard practice because he's seen more vigorous growth, less disease, and a greater yield. Here's some pictures from one of the first trials I did. I donated a truckload of these guys for them to give it a try. And as you can probably see here, the, the first harvest results were significant. Over here we have corn at six weeks without and at six weeks with. They used compost on both and the same on both except the biochar. And here's at harvest without biochar and with biochar. Now, the first harvest results were, were impressive. They were significant. But now, more than two years later, it's even more impressive. It's no longer so easy to photograph side by side. But it's even more impressive because it has become apparent to him that not only did it improve his soil for a crop, but it has continued to do so for years out and will likely continue to do so for the rest of his life. Here's some pictures. Again, it's not so easy to photograph because it's all mixed up and everything's everywhere and all his favorite stuff's now in the biochar area. <laughs> Using biochar in agriculture can help to give us greater nutrient efficiency, greater water efficiency, and greater microbial activity, all which lead to greater productivity. Not only can it give us greater agricultural productivity, but in doing so, can help us with waste management, energy production, and climate change mitigation. Our resources are precious, and they're finite. The future of farming, the future of our food, the future of our children depends on our ability to make more with less. Thank you all very much.